Are we at a point where a resilient dollar is a problem? First, welcome to you and Lisa to the UK, and thank you for bringing us good weather. Um, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, we, we are try. near the problem. We are near the point where it, it, the dollar is too strong for the rest of the world, not for the U.S., but for the rest of the world. Um, you know, it's this phenomenon I call little fires everywhere. And whether it is food prices or oil prices or strong dollar, that contributes to the little fires everywhere. The answer, by the way, is in the hands of the other countries, not the U.S. There isn't much the U.S. can do about a strong currency, but there's lots that other countries can do. The panel that I had yesterday in Davos, Dr. L. Aaron, included Sir Lawrence Friedman. And the most quiet moment in that too short an hour was here where he linked dollar dynamics into our food crisis and into the memory of Tunisia, the Arab Spring. Our Eric Martin as well is focused on your Egypt. When you look at the fragility of Egypt, in the memory of the Arab Spring, what is the model to help begin to solve the crisis? It's a big issue. Um, Kristalina Georgieva of the IMF months ago said a cost of living crisis in the West is the risk of famine in commodity importing developing countries. That's particularly true for fragile economies. For economies like Egypt, like Turkey, um, the decision is how much do you subsidize and how much you pass on to the consumer. And food is a particularly delicate issue. Most countries will end up subsidizing. So you will unlikely to get a repeat of 2011. However, and this is important, you have to worry about the finances. This is a very difficult environment for commodity importing developing countries, Tom. Mohammed, before we move on uh, to uh, what's going on in rates and how we move ahead in this uh, this economy, what do you think in terms of offsetting those costs of something like uh, the windfall tax, as just was announced here in the United Kingdom? You know, I've been arguing for a while that the right thing to do is to impose a windfall tax and to use the proceeds to protect the most vulnerable segments of the population. And that's what the UK did yesterday. Um, is the windfall tax perfect? Of course not. It's not a first best solution, but there are no first best solutions in this world anymore. It is by far superior to every other second best solution. And I think you're gonna have more countries look at this as a temporary measure to protect the most vulnerable segments of the population. Is it just going to be the oil and gas companies, Mohammed, or are we also going to be looking at potentially uh, for coal companies and, and, and copper and all the other commodities in addition to food producers? I suspect we'll be focused on oil and gas. Um, going further than that gets really tricky very quickly. So I suspect it will be focused on oil and gas. Moving forward, Mohammed, we were talking in Davos about how the banner headline was about the Ukrainian war, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine. But really, under the surface, when you peeled back the onion, it was all about China and the fact that any kind of prolonged shutdown could torpedo global momentum. How closely are you watching that? If we do get the lockdowns continuing to year end, does that mean that we are going to be close to a global recession? Yeah, I'm watching it very closely. Um, because what happens in China impacts both global aggregate demand and global aggregate supply. Uh, we forget that China is a major consumer of products also made elsewhere. We saw what the retail numbers looked like. They were pretty horrible. We also are reminded how important China still is in the supply chain. So I look at this very carefully. Lisa, the concern we have, and I know that you are very attuned to this, is that the three major areas of the global economy are slowing at the same time. And there is no compensating locomotive anywhere in the global economy right now. So we've got to be careful that we, we don't get the self-feeding process. And this is important because the marketplace has embraced the possibility of a pause in September. Mm -hmm. Be careful, because the only reason the Fed would pause is because demand, demand has come down really fast. Right. And that's not going to be good for risk assets. Mohammed, I want to go back to the only game in town, 
And folks, this is, you know, you sit there and you go, well, why is this guy so visible? What is it so special about Hilarion? And what he has done is articulate game theory across our economics, finance, and investment. And one of the nuances, Mohammed, of the only game in town is separating, and in this case, Chairman Powell's desirable from Chairman Powell's feasible. What is the feasible set right now for the American Central Bank? I think, at best, the feasible set is what Chair Powell called a soft-tish landing. And the ish is really important. I think the time has passed for a soft landing. We could have done it, but that would have implied the Fed moving nine months ago. It should have, it didn't. So instead of tightening into a growing and dynamic economy, it is tightening mm -hmm. into a slowing economy. So it is very difficult to get a soft landing. So the best you can hope for right now is a soft dish landing. What's the probability of that happening? Not as high as I would like it to be. Um, I think the Fed is going to have to decide between two policy mistakes. Hit the brakes too hard and risk a recession or tap the brakes in a stop go pattern, including pause right. in September would be an example of that and risk having inflation well into 2023. Dr. O'Larian, Olivia Blanchard was talking about Stan Fisher and said he was our great North Star, which is an extraordinary statement about the gentleman of 1998. We have a conceit now that our currencies are more floating. Can the release valve for Chairman Powell, as he approaches the feasible, be dollar dynamics because we have a more open, more floating currency system? Um, it's not open enough in the U.S. economy for that. Look, the solution to all, all our issue is a surge of productivity. If we get significant productivity growth, we can reconcile all sorts of difficult trade-offs. So the key issue is whether we get a surge in productivity, and you can get that with all sorts of things happening underneath. It would be wonderful, for example, to also have labor force participation go up, especially among women. That, that would help. It would be wonderful to have supply chains improving. That would help. Um, is all that going to happen in the short term? Very unlikely, unfortunately. Mohammed, you're talking about how a softish landing is looking like the most uh, best outcome, and it looks not that likely. Do you think that the recent data that we've seen, and frankly, the assumption in markets that momentum is waning and that the Fed's already getting what it wants, do you think that that's gotten ahead of itself? Or do you think that they're onto something, that there has been already a slowing that will make it easier for the Fed? So I think the marketplace is going through two processes. One is a dip was overdue. We had eight weeks of successive declines. And clearly there are people who are finding bargains and there are single name bargains. And the fact that we've had the largest inflow into the equity markets globally for the last 10 weeks is significant. We are seeing dip buyers. So you have a very technical reaction after eight straight weeks. That I totally understand. What I don't understand is the notion that suddenly the Fed will be able to hike twice and then and then take it easy and pause. It, that The only reason, as I said earlier, that happens is if demand collapses. And if demand collapses, equities are not going to do well. You saw what happened when Target announced that they were being impacted not just on the cost side, but also on the revenue side because of high inflation. And the last thing this equity market needs right now right. is further concerns about earnings.